when, back in the days when we had things called education committees, I was the chair of the education committee in Gateshead, and that got me um, a route into being a member of the Association of Metropolitan Authorities Education Committee, the AMA Education Committee. Um, I became, for one year, the chair of the Council of Local Education Authorities, CLIA, if you remember that, when that was when the, a, the AMA and the ACC Education Committee came together. And then the LGA Education Committee and then Executive, I was a member of that as well. So that's how I came to know people like Chris and people like Nick as well through going to conferences, but also I, I was particularly delighted to, to, to um, find that Nick was going to be addressing our governor's conference in Gateshead, I think on a couple of occasions, Nick, uh, when David Auburn was our director of education, and David Auburn was a good guy. Uh, uh, David Auburn was, I think, a real good guy, a real educationist who cared deeply and passionately about education and about children. And um, apart from appointing a couple of really good head teachers as a governor, one of the other best years' work that I was ever involved with was appointing David Auburn as our director of education in, in Gateshead. So it's a particular pleasure to see Mick come along, because I knew that was a route that he had come through, being a director of education and an assistant to, to, to other people in, in, in education services around the country. But as a particular Manchester and also Birmingham. Right. Now, we know that Mick has been, for many years, one of the country's leading, interesting and challenging think uh, thinkers about teaching and learning. He's someone who's always resisted seeing the predictable or the trite when the truth and the right needed to be said. Now, many, many of you will have heard his illuminating insights into what makes, what's, what makes good education good. Delivered with humour, it comes from his keen observation of what goes on in young people's minds, but also in their classrooms. His observations are rooted in reality. To Mick, rhetoric is a foreign country. Uh, although if rhetoric was a country, it would probably be very high up in the PISA ratings. <laughs> <laughs> um, in his book, Thinking Aloud on Schooling, which we are, uh, have a pleasure of seeing today, Thinking Aloud about Schooling, Mick says that we need uh, an education stream. A bit like the Arab stream, but about education in the United Kingdom. And I agree. Absolutely, given the current regime and where we find ourselves now. Perhaps our discussion today will mark the first signs of that spring taking place. A spring that, I, that will, I hope, open up a real national debate about education, what it's for, and how we can make it relevant and meaningful so that each and every young person in the United Kingdom can fulfil their own personal potential. I'm going to hand you back to Chris in a moment, but I'd like also to say thanks to, to my staff and also to Chris for making the arrangements for this discussion and to the Independent Thinking Press for providing us with our refreshments. I hope you've enjoyed your tea. So, without any further ado, back to Chris. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm aware of, and I don't know if, if any of you have not been here before, if you get a little flashing bell and a noise on the green screen, then Ian um, and Kevin and one or two others might have to rush back and, and vote against Mr Haig or, or something. <laughs> Who knows? So I'm going to thank Ian. Um, Ian and I go back a long way. He's, he's known more about education than most politicians, which is a very dangerous thing for education. But, you know, you have to do what you have to do. And um, this reminds me a bit, bit of a wedding breakfast, although it's a, an afternoon tea. And for those old, as old as I am, of which there are a few in the room, they always used to read out telegrams at weddings for people who couldn't get there. Well, I've not got a telegram, but I've got an email. And it's the only one I'm going to read out. We've had lots of apologies. But this one, it says, Unfortunately, the Secretary of State regrets he is unable to accept your invitation due to a prior commitment in his diary. However... He hopes the event will be a great success. So I think we ought to just reflect on that as we continue our discussion. Um, I've trod the boards with Mick. In fact, we even did, did a cabaret once, didn't we, at the holiday in Aylesbury? Um, and Mick contributed a chapter to Take Heed Mr Gove, which we published two years ago, in the hope that Mr Gove would take heed. <laughs> well, history is the judge of that. Um, but I was delighted that, that Mick managed to collate 
just a few sentences into this impressive tome. Is it an impressive tome? Well, again, I suppose history judge that too, Mick. But Mick's going to make a few cogent points. We're then going to gather up some comments and questions and contributions and then turn it into a debate. Um, I know people are going to have to drift away. If you're on a time ticket on Virgin Trains, you've normally got to leave by about one o'clock, so you've not even have got here. But we have to be out of here just before six because there's a dinner that we've not been invited to. But uh, we'll let the, the, the conversation flow up and down the table, around the table, until just before six. But Mick, over to you, the star of the show. Look, it's uh, good to be with you, but it's a very strange position to be in. It's like being at the tennis at Wimbledon, and we'll cope if we can. Um, I was asked to talk uh, for the first few minutes, no longer than eight, I was told, which I thought was very precise, no longer than eight minutes, and to throw some pebbles in the pond that would enable us to have uh, a discussion for about an hour. And uh, I was asked if I could read it, which is very unusual for me, because usually I just talk, and uh, anybody who knows me knows that eight, breaths is less, uh, eight minutes is less than a breath really, so it's very hard for me to, uh, to accomplish the task that I've been given. But I'm going to read what I've been asked to uh, talk about, and I uh, hope that you'll find it a useful pebble in the pond to, uh, to pick up on. This morning I was in Birmingham, I, I was asked to go and speak to 400 teachers in a, a big room in Birmingham, and I, I was doing about how we can better teach mathematics. And at the break time in the middle of the morning, I said, oh, by the way, I'm going to the Commons this afternoon and there'll be some MPs there. Is there anything you'd like me to tell them? Now, I did think of reading out their answers. <laughs> but I thought that may not be as polite as what I've written. So here you go. I'll read and you see whether you can make anything of this for uh, the rest of the discussion. Uh, basically, I'd have to talk about the future of schooling. So here you go. We need a radical, red, radical new education manifesto. The school system as it stands, distorted by whim, high stakes accountability and low trust, is no longer fit for purpose. We need fresh thinking. We cannot carry on with short-term, politically driven, tinkering with an old-fashioned system. From the outset in 1870, politicians had sought to use the school system for short-term political gain by addressing the perceived problems of the day, whether they're social, economic or fabricated. Instead, we need a forward-looking, redefined purpose for schooling where the people involved take appropriate responsibility to create a system which is carefully managed, research and practice driven, parent and media supported, and focused upon long-term aims, regardless of the change in government. This is happening in some countries, where a Concord Act for schooling has been established as an all-party agreement to be supported over time. The status quo cannot continue. We do need an education spring, an uprising of passion and commitment to the role of schooling in the education of our young. Politics can change the face of education in structural terms, but it can't and shouldn't change the heart. This means building consensus and holding to agreed courses of action through, per through a permanent body at arm's length from Parliament and Ministers, a National Council for Schooling, which wrestles away from the meddlers and unelected advisers and places it, sorry, wrestles schooling away from the meddlers and unelected advisers and places it back in the control of wider society, employers, teachers, parents and pupils. A consensus needs to be built around the purpose for schooling and how it fits within the overall education of pupils. We need to define better the aims and the purpose of the schooling we offer. This means setting minimum standards of provision for childhood and youth and building agreement about how the roles of schools, parents and community complement each other. Can the purpose be the same for all children regardless of social circumstances? We need to be clear about aspiration as an outlook of worth, contribution and spirit rather than simply aspiration in terms of exam passes and careers. Parents need to see themselves as contributors to the system rather than consumers of a commodity and should support their local school rather than exploiting the admission process. A levy on pupils who use schools further away might be directed at the school that is their nearest. If we're clearer about the purpose of schooling, then the clarity about the role of teaching emerges. Teaching is a science, 
and an art, a vocation and a profession. The principles of teaching include the transmission of big ideas, the immersion in the discipline <coughs> of knowledge domains, the detailed instruction of processes and skills, and crucially, the building of enthusiasm, motivation and capability in the learner. The principles of teaching do not include using school time for trivial activity. And just as nursing has recognised that holding nurses to account for the narrow, measurable activities of treatment alone, sorry, measurable activity of treatment alone leads to a lack of attention to their central focus of compassion and care, so teaching us to recognise the danger of too narrow a focus on the technicalities of individual lessons. Therefore, regulation and accountability need to be better man managed and more proportionate. High stakes, data driven accountability has led schools naturally towards playing the game to achieve recognitions rather than acting with educational integrity. And hence, we see slow progress in the use of ICT and computing, more sterile learning for pupils, less emphasis on the cultural and the artistic. The spouted autonomies are a sleight of hand to appeal to the public, while testing acts as a straitjacket for schools. Schools are only free within the shackles that surround them. That's not to say there should be no accountability. What if teachers were to be licensed for five, seven year periods and the continuation of the license depended upon effective professional development and contribution? Ofsted should simply be the judge of whether a school is good enough or not. Lessons shouldn't be the sole unit of teaching for children. The crux of our present inertia is the influence of national politics. Most national politicians con confuse policy with posturing, polarising and positioning. A few are peddling half-truths over international comparisons or abusing their rights and the rights of pupils with blatant and cynical hectoring. They manipulate the school agenda for bigger policy outcomes than education. They are far from the radical people that they pretend to be and conversely hold back the profession itself by dint of undue influence from czars and special advisers. Indeed, ministers tend to be risk averse, seeking policy change that will carry favour with an electorate and denying change that will be good for pupils. The teaching profession often acquiesces to the latest ministerial mood swing, complaining rather than being involved, sometimes grabbing the agenda with enthusiasm or because of funding. Many in school feel their integrity compromised between their belief in the purpose of schooling and the games they feel forced to play. Some of the ways ministers behave is dangerous for our democracy. Schooling needs to act, and those in the profession need to see themselves as school activists, schooling activists. For example, heads should always respond to consultations and expect their responses to be taken seriously. Or they could monopolise MP surgery to get their point to ministers, and schools should be prohibited as venues for photo opportunities for MPs. They could visit by all means, but leave the camera behind. As a first step on the way forward, we do need an elected National Council for Schooling. Elections should be contested not by geographical location, but by technical, technological and national ballot. Either a, number, a minimum number of votes or a top, say, 25 scorers to be elected. The Council should oversee aspects of school organisation and advise in national policy and practice in teaching, as does NICE in health. The National Council for Schooling would also work to develop society's understanding of practice and as a channel for progress in schooling, the National Council would manage funding, determine expectations on parents and the profession and hold fast to society's hope for childhood and youth. In, short, discipline, in a short time, disciplined innovation would grow and the system would be recognised with accord and with pride. So really, I've got four, four things that I think really need talking about. First of all, a defined purpose for schooling. Secondly, clarity about what the role of teaching should be in our society. Third, proportionate and measured regulation. And fourth, the National Council for Schooling that could take us forward. To finish, our children need the adults of this country behind them to lift their expectation and performance. They need to feel the promise of good schooling and understand the investment being made in them and the opportunity offered by our nation. And I think there's a challenge for all of us in thinking again about where teaching should go and calling for something that's far more radical than we've got at the, pro at the, at the moment. So I hope it's something to talk about. I hope that you can uh, at least express your opinion over the next few minutes. 
so that, minister, uh, so that uh, members of parliament have the opportunity to respond and at least think about what we say. Thanks for listening to me. I did, I did try and get them... Well, first of all, thanks ever so much. I've really enjoyed listening to that lot. I will uh, finish by saying I do agree with Deborah in her interpretation of what I mean. And the notion of a tick box for teachers is way off where I stand. I think that it is about teachers contributing to their own profession. And they ought to demonstrate what they've contributed over the five years in order to make themselves and the profession better. And they should be able to do that if they're good professionals. I've been making notes as we've gone along. I don't know what sense I'll make of this lot. Um, but I'll just make a few quick points. Is that yes, right? Yes, indeed. I mean, I, when I was at QCA, I had to go to the select committee several times. And I went once when I was director of education. And uh, uh, in spite of what was said, it's not the most gripping experience. Um, I remember the first question on one occasion when we were supposedly debating the value of the national curriculum. It came from a Tory, uh, and because uh, there was only one Tory on this, because it was when Labour in power. And the question was something like uh, after 20 odd years, of a national curriculum and national assessment. Can you explain why 25% of all English children end up in the bottom quartile? And similarly, we've got a dashboard process at the minute which puts us into quintile, so it sounds posh. But actually, it sounds rigorous. It's a real mess. And unless somebody says this real mess of the dashboard can't live, we, we have to live with it for ages before we make any progress and take it forward. A few observations. I thought Melissa's point about, um, you know, the danger is we get defensive and miserable is, is really important. Uh, and one of the problems we've got in this room is most people here are very centrally concerned with education to some degree. And uh, last year I was poorly for a little while and I was at home for two months. The first time since I was four that I hadn't been into schools on a regular basis. And so I heard the news about education as somebody outside of education hears it. I heard it off the television, through media, and I formed an opinion of what was going on. And the schools that I was listening to being described were incredibly different from the schools I spend day by day in. And I think we have a massive problem in terms of getting the general public to understand what goes on in schools. If the only vehicle is what politicians tell us, that is a really big problem because of this polarisation of debate and the way in which uh, the, the debate is channeled into various trivial arguments. I have to say, I think the current debate about the national curriculum is a really good thing to set hairs running over there while we get on with other things. Because the reality is that what's in the national curriculum doesn't really make much difference once it's passed because in the main, teachers teach what they want to, can teach, or what they're interested in, or what they think somebody will test in a very short time. The current national curriculum is to a large extent ignored while we focus on the things that uh, we think are demanded by assessment or by Ofsted. Um, Ofsted itself doesn't look at many aspects of the current national curriculum, so they largely don't get done. I mean, as a bit, because we ought to be challenging a bit, we mustn't pretend it's all right out there. If you just want to think about it, most of us, uh, uh, if, we, if we all sat around this table and just headed off in directions away from the table today during the school day, I wonder how far we would have got before we saw a nine-year-old using a piece of equipment other than pencil today. An 11-year-old this morning doing anything other than a SATS practice test. And what we've got in schools, if we're not careful, is a sort of idea that it's all all right and it's going to get worse when actually we do have a lot of practice which is questionable because there's a rhetoric about freedom which isn't followed through in practice. So the, the current talk about autonomy and freedom is a fascinating one because it sounds as though you can do what you like and do what the children need and you're free from the bureaucracy of government when in fact what it means is you are free to teach the things and not have to teach the things that you will not be tested on, not be assessed on. And so what you do is you keep people shackled and then say you can go where you like in the shackles and then you'll be all right really. So I think there's a really serious issue under this in terms of, of what the media says and where the media simply takes us. Um, over the sort of session we've talked about simple questions. The trouble with all these simple questions is they're really hard answers. And that's why you do need a debate rather than this sort of Here's the answer to that simple question, it's another simple answer. They're really difficult. And this notion of evidence and what they do in other countries 
is one that's being used a lot now without proper exploration or proper scrutiny by people who ought to know better. And it's one of the reasons I think we do need something like a version of NICE that sanctions practice or says certain practice is detrimental to children and that we ought to be doing these things in school or we ought not to be doing things in school to help it move along. It wasn't long ago that the numeracy hour insisted that uh, there were various phases uh, through that teaching and children at some point in their numeracy hour would use apparatus and equipment and would get sort of stuck into all the sorts of uh, making maths work and seeing sense of it, concrete they used to call it. If you go around those schools now in primary sector, in that session that's often the numeracy hour but not called that, you see very little use of apparatus in many, many schools because the need for evidence dominates the work that the teachers do. So I've been written down their learning objectives, which takes about a third of the lesson. You've got a great race to write down some answers to prove the learning objectives before you get out, because you must have the evidence in case the catchers come later to check what you're doing. So we do need something that really looks at practice in another way. Some of the simple things that people have said need sorting are the curriculum, which I think is actually way more complicated than uh, most of us seem to think. Uh, it is an entitlement, it started as an entitlement. We can't now tell whether it's an entitlement or a talking point. And everybody fighting over what's in and wanting their bit in means it's unmanageable. And therefore it is easy to say, well, we're offering a curriculum that's a requirement, but not if you're in an academy. So is it an inducement to become one? I think that's too clever. I don't think they ever thought of that. The notion that teaching and leadership are the two fundamentals uh, you can't disagree with that, but on top of that you've got parental aspiration and parental expectation for their children and the child's disposition to, to learning and what we do to encourage them and how you get aspiration, as Caroline says, bigger than simply how many SATS results you're going to get and what your outcome in, uh, in, in an Ofsted inspection is going to be. Um, there, there is a whole set of things in, in terms of what Gareth was saying about education being an emancipatory activity. The point of education is to help people grow into something bigger than they thought they would and that society will change because of the way people become educated. One of the worrying things about the national curriculum is while you keep children learn the proposed national curriculum is while you keep children learning fragments, you stop them visiting big ideas. And if children visit big ideas, they might want to reshape the society in which they are. And so one of the really big dangers that's rarely picked up about the proposals from the national curriculum is that by teaching children fragments, you keep poor people where they belong and don't let them uh, find out what the big issues are in society. And I think it's a fascinating sleight of hand, again, that's emerging. Uh, I think I'll finish by saying that a lot talked about the sort of morale of the profession and the sort of morality of it, the trust, the accountability, the wrong responsibility. I think we've got to get to some sort of uh, proportionate regulation that really makes sense to the people being regulated and helps people outside the system to understand what the regulation means. On the one hand it's too simple and on the other it's too complex and we put too much store in Ofsted and I'll say as I always say the only consistency in Ofsted inspection is that it's inconsistent but the way it's reported gives it enormous credibility and sadly because some schools are graded outstanding it stops them complaining about the system that graded them such. And it's a real problem for the system because um, it, 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 it's hard to break through that sort of veneer. Uh, I think we do need a debate. I think uh, Christine's right. It's a forlorn hope that politicians will back out, but they could put themselves up for election. And given the image of politicians at the moment, it might be doubtful whether a lot will get in. Uh, but the, I'm not on about an election like the one for police commissioners where... <laughs> you know, hardly anybody voted. I think we should get away from that localised notion of the election. We've got a modern society that ought to be able to use IT properly and we should be able to find people who could be committed to education for the long haul and be really interested in making education a better thing. And it could be politicians, it could be other people instead. Uh, I think I'll, I'll finish by uh, simply saying uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for listening, thanks for contributing. I hope it made some impact on the politicians who are here. I actually think the politicians who are here come because they want to listen, want to move it on, and want to make a difference. And most politicians do want to do that. I think that we somehow got to make sure that the, the system works in, in the uh, favour of the children 
rather than political class. And there's a big challenge for all of us in that. If you've got a copy of that book, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, you won't enjoy all of it, I know that. Um, but I hope you enjoy some little bit. So if you'll focus on the pages you enjoy, and then to the, turn to the pages that make you wince. The pages that make you wince are probably the ones that will make more impact. So thanks for listening, thanks for being here, and I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you.